I'm Janine, and this is Outside the Box. Standing by to join me is Beth George of BYOBbagels.com. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, when I logged into 1 Million Cups at 5.30 in the morning, my time, a week ago, <laughs> um, I loved your story. You had, you said, I don't have any slides, whatever. You were just very organic and very real, and I loved your whole story of how you started BYOB Bagels. But before we get into that, tell me a little bit about your backstory. My backstory. So I am um, the, I'm the youngest of five of the family. Um, both my parents are of Lebanese American, they're Middle Eastern descent. All of their parents were born in the Middle East before it was divided up as Lebanon, Syria, Jordan. It was just Assyria at the time. Okay. I've recently learned that my great grandparents were refugees. They, they were um, Christian, you know, immigrants. They were minorities, and the Ottoman Empire wasn't really tolerating this local rule anymore. Um, and I just found some of my relatives actually in Brazil because my Recently? mother. Yes, in the past few years, because Recently. my mother's entire family, my grandmother's entire family on my mother's side, immigrated to Brazil, Fortaleza. Oh. And my grandmother was given away to an aunt. She was the oldest of 10. She was given married, away. Given away. This is what I've been told. Oh. Be married off. She had a choice of three men and married my grandfather, whom I never met. And, I mean, it choked me up actually to think about it because she was like 15, you know, and 15 and married. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, she may have been older, but she said she was 15 because that was the right age at the time. Sure. So that was about 1908. And, um, they ended up in Western Massachusetts and had 10 children, my grandparents and one child drowned. Uh, my mm -hmm. grandmother used to talk about this child all the time. He was very much a part of our, you know, mental, our, our presence, even though yes. he had died when he was four, that was Uncle Albert. And um, there were 10 of them. And so my mother and dad married and they were from, you know, similar tight Lebanese communities. It's interesting, on my father's side, everybody married within kind of the Lebanese community, except for one. My mother's side, all the men married European descent. Interesting. Um, so those cousins have a very different experience than mm -hmm. kind of the pure-blooded cousins that were more identified as being other. And my, uh, my father was an identical twin married to my mother's sister. So I have some- Whoa. Cousins. Yeah. <laughs> But my mother, really, you know, I look back at it, and I'm trying to write about it. Um, she was just amazing. You know, she was just amazing. So I'm almost five to seven. She was four, nine. Like, I'm just this giant. Yeah. My yeah. And she, at age 23 or 24, walked into this place in Williamstown, Mass. It was a natural spring swimming pool. I said, wow, this is amazing. I love this place. And the woman, whose name was Helen Hanley at was from New York, liked to drink a little bit. Um, just said to her, do you want to buy it? And my mother said, yes. And so she convinced my father, they'd been married <laughs> for three years, that they were going to buy this swimming pool and do this thing. You know, now I think about it, I get my will from her, right? <laughs> she, so at 20, so they owned it for 53 years. Actually, my father died 52 years in. Wait, wait, and, back up. So it, you said it was a hot spring? Yes, it's a hot spring, a warm mineral spring in Williamstown, Massachusetts Amazing. called Sand Springs. It's still in existence. It's now owned mostly, I think, as a nonprofit by most of the former members. Mm -hmm. But they did sell it. My mother sold it to a private company. But it was a total sweat equity place. I mean, it didn't really keep books. They didn't really, you know, a lot of. <laughs> so I grew up you know, at, by age six working, you know, we had to go and clean the beach, we called it and, you know, mm -hmm. pick up garbage, clean the toilets as I got a little older, wow. the burgers. And then I became, you know, I had to become water safety certified. So I became the head lifeguard. I'm the youngest of five. So it was just kind of this progression I taught swimming. The one thing my mother always said to me was, you can make you, I'm not paying you, like you work your ass off here, excuse me, but you work, you work. She would say that probably. But you can make money here. Oh. So you figure out ways to make money. So I used to babysit. I used to teach swimming. I would do like little art classes. Like they let me use the Great. place to make yes. money, but they weren't going to give me money or Got even it. pay me money. So I think. But what's interesting is it gave you skill sets 
and experience and confidence. And then you would go make money using those skills. Right. Starting at age six, I think I sold worms or seven. <laughs> <laughs> and then I bought out my business partner, the next door neighbor for a dollar. I remember that. <laughs> Do you have business cards? <laughs> <laughs> Not for the worm business. It's hysterical. <laughs> You know, I thought I was young. I was like eight and I had business cards in New York City because I used to um, help these Russian kids with their homework. They couldn't speak English very well. And I also um, brought over my little Snoopy dictionary and I would teach them English and then teach them how to dive. And I was literally eight years old. That's so cool. Yeah. See, I, I was so I was kind of born into this. So yeah. going into academia and going to a private liberal arts college and going to law school. It was very foreign to me, but I did it anyway. Anyway. How did that happen? How did you decide to go to law school? Um, so, well, I can tell you, college was one of the families I babysat for. Um, the mother really believed in me. She was like, you are just, you're different. Like, and you need to not go to local secretarial school or whatever your mother has planned for you. You need to go to college somewhere. So right. she brought in my college tours. Yeah. Um, interesting, tragic. Um, she was my mentor as a high schooler and her son went to college after I did the same college, Bates College, but then he died in 9-11. And so oh. they, and then she got sick after that, but they actually started a foundation. So I kind of learned to be, I learned a lot about life from her. Mm -hmm. like, really what a gift. Amazing. So then when I was in, and her husband was the first lawyer I ever met. So during college she'd say you know you really should consider being a lawyer I was president of my class I was always advocating for people I was really the underdog president but I was president um and so I you know I always was advocating for people great, even great. as a little kid kind of beating up the bully who was and then I'd get in trouble mm -hmm. and I'd explain what was going on you know <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah and then I I, so I worked for four years before going to law school. I went from Maine, where I went to college, to New York City. Mm -hmm. When I came to New York City for the first time, it was the first time I really felt like I was home. You know, this yes. feeling of not feeling other, but feeling like a part of something bigger. Yes. yes. And you're talking to somebody who grew up in New York City, and then I was staying in Connecticut, but living in New York, you just feel like, there's so many people and it's so diverse and you feel at home. Yeah, exactly. It, and and um, so then while in New York, I actually got a job as an office manager for a law office and I was only 24 and I was really young. I was actually a paralegal and then was promoted to office manager. It was Park Avenue. I mean, my mother came to the office and was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and and then from there it was during the 80s and you know new york was still coming out of its 70s like new york was burning up uptown was burning yeah. the bronx was burning and i actually lived in washington heights at the time uptown and so as i would take like the expensive car home and you'd see people like huddled over garbage cans yeah um i i was like i gotta i gotta go into public interest law <laughs> it was just the Good. thing I wanted to do. And my husband's family, even though they're they're Jewish from New York, but moved to New Hampshire. So he was kind of orphaned like I was in a way, you know, where a Jewish family in a little rural town in New Hampshire. And I was an Arab family in a little like college town in Massachusetts. Right. We really didn't have communities that we identified. Sure. And so we met in college, but his parents lived in um, New Hampshire. His dad was a doctor. His sister went to the law school in New Hampshire. So we just decided we would go to New Hampshire. That's great. So that's how that happened. I want to uh, dive into what you're doing now, but also have you share advice for maybe definitely people that are out of work? Because that's where this whole show came about, where mm -hmm. I want to talk about, you know, we have over 40 million people who lost their jobs to COVID. Mm -hmm. Devastating. You have some skill sets of resilience, mm -hmm. which are really important. And maybe you could give some advice to people that are, uh, you know, out of work or even students, like, because you have kids. Well, I think that much of it is understand the value we have, right? I think we often tend to 
undervalue ourselves. And I'm guilty of that mm -hmm. at times where we just say, oh, I've got nothing. Well, what do I have now? Um, and I'll, I was explaining this to someone just before COVID hit, I got into, I had two serious injuries in New York City. One, I fell and tripped into a subway grate, nearly lost my finger. Oh. And then the other one is I got hit from behind and you know, herniated multiple discs. And so this is a very physical job. So it's still a little hard for me to do. Now I'm just getting back and then COVID hits and I was really ready. I was like, I guess I have, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I have no value. Oh, so terrible. I started, the one thing I started to do was, I was like, I can't be depressed. And this is what I loved about reading, just the introduction of your book. I'm like, I can either just say life sucks or I'm going to do something about it. Yeah. So I just, I knew, I know I'm a good teacher, right? I know that. So I just started putting on little videos from Instagram and doing little snippets of teaching and talking about resiliency and talking about kind of finding value in ourselves and that we can make changes. And I was doing this all out of my tiny kitchen because this Great. place wasn't open. Yeah. And then I started getting calls from people who were also saying, wait, could I do this? And I'm like, yes, you can, you know? And so right. one of the things is, is to be willing to, you know, I like to empower, but then somebody has to embrace that. It's like, yes, you can make change, right? Yes. And then I like, to teach from that, but then you have to learn. This is, and then I don't hang on. I I let go, and then it's up to them it's to good. continue to soar. Yeah, right? You're not going to hold their hand. Not I'm not gonna, for a period of time. There's a little bit of hand holding. Yes, and then well, it's I'm like no, and that's why I'm not a franchise. So the so the one of the reasons, but so the advice I can give is really you know look at your value. And write it down. If you can't simply just say it is, then start writing down all the cool things you've done in your life. Yeah. You know, because we are, we have done lots of things. And then what value that has. And if that means if somebody just went through a terrible divorce, well, what, did, what happened during that? And now you're on the other side of it. How did you survive that? Write all those things down. That might be something you can help somebody with, right? Yeah. Yes. Or you've lost your job. What can you do? Okay, this particular job doesn't exist anymore. It has to do with being in the public. So what can you do? How do we pivot that, right? I only taught in person, but now I teach remotely, right? We start to learn how to do things. Right. It's essential. Mm -hmm. What I really like is my business partner is 82 and he's like, he doesn't get on Zoom himself, but once he's on with me, he's just like all in. He's like, I can't believe we're actually having these conversations with people, showing them things touring them around the bakery, you know, so, so cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you want to give us a tour? Want a tour? Sure. So I'll, I'm going to treat you as if you were one of my new clients. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, by the way, we didn't even dive into what BYOB is. Okay. So BYOB means be your own boss. I'm going to turn on some lights. These okay. are uh, Be your own boss build your own business, bake your own bagels. It's kind of whatever you want it to be. So even though I teach bagel making, it's really about being your own boss. So yeah. not that I'll teach somebody necessarily to be something else, but it's that encouragement. It's yes. like, if, so I'll quickly tell you how I got into bagel making because I didn't tell you that, but I got into it because I was a child advocate attorney for years. Most of the kids I worked with were diagnosed with something recommended for drugs and I didn't see any improvement because I was with these kids for like 10 years. You didn't years. see any improvement with the drugs? Improvement. No, no improvement. Let's say no like maybe it's ADD or autism. Mm -hmm. Got it. You know, and I'm not talking about like severe autism where you're non-communicative. Sure. You're talking like more of a, you know, pervasive developmental disorder and the kid is, a little, you know, not focusing, right. maybe not communicating directly. So my son at age four started exhibiting behaviors that were like this. And then by age five, six, when he was in public school, they're like ADHD, Asperger's, PDD, you know, pervasive developmental disorder, sensory integrative disorder. He's driving us crazy. We can't take it. I'm just going to tell you now, he is like the mellowest, zenest, most brilliant human I know. And he wow. just graduated with a degree, honors, chemical engineering. Okay. What? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, 
they got it all wrong. I got it right. What was it? Was it um, oh, his gut? His okay. Gut, what he was eating. Microbiome. My, the microbiome was a mess. Okay. Gut to brain, right? Yeah. And so he couldn't eat wheat. So I created a spelt bagel for him. What, you know, my kid is half Arab, half Jewish. He couldn't eat wheat anymore. Okay. So I said, what do you want? He's like, I miss, I miss bagels. I'm like, we're going to make the best spell bagel ever. And that's how I started with the bagel scene. Amazing. And we did pull him out of the public school. We, I charted him. He was my own little clinical study, you know, mm -hmm. and we could see when he ate something, a certain preservative, a certain artificial color, his, yeah, his ears would get red. He'd get flared. He'd go up different things. He'd get upset. Sure. By fifth grade, we put him back into public school and I got a phone call again. Like, I'm like, oh boy. They're like, uh, he, we just did a test with him and he tested 10th to 11th grade math in fifth grade. I'm like, yeah, what? I know. <laughs> I can deal with this kid. So that was another impetus to go to New York because there were a lot more opportunities for a very other kid. Sure. So amazing. And spelt for people that don't know, is that a gluten free grain? It's not gluten free. It's an ancient grain that has gluten in it, but the gluten in it is water soluble and it hasn't been hybridized. Like so much of the uh, wheat today, these very modern wheats, the gluten has been made so strong. It's called glutenin and, and gliadidin are the two elements of gluten. And those have been messed with. And so our, our, our bread doesn't break down in this. And, you know, it starts to back up. Well, it. it's felt breaks down. So if you're not celiac and, you know, you don't have this autoimmune disorder, but but wheat bothers you. Spelt is a really nice alternative. I should try that because I don't eat gluten. Yeah, yeah, I can understand why. I mean, yeah. and the bagels I make now, I break down all the enzymes because I ferment it like multiple times, even though they're wheat. Yes, they're and that breaks it down? That breaks down the gluten by fermenting it? it? It The enzymes start to break down, yeah, the proteins and the protein is the gluten. Which means it, it digests better in your gut? Yes. And you don't have leaky gut? Yeah, no. I mean, we don't like my son can eat these, but he'll still take enzymes. But he was his whole issue was leaky gut. I mean, you and you must be familiar with leaky gut. I am because my daughter had that when she was younger. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'd still would like to do an experiment with her. I don't think she'd go for it. <laughs> yeah. How old is she now? She's 18. Yeah. 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 They only let us like use them as um guinea pigs for so long. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but that's, uh, you know, it's very important to understand inflammation diet. Yes. It affects everything. Everything. And so I actually, I make bagels, but I don't eat them every day. And I figure if people are going to make bagels, you might as well make them in a way and with ingredients that don't cause further aggravation of the gut. It's great. So go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Give that's us okay. A story. So I love my, this is my, um, table this is my baker's table so this is Ooh. kind of the world it all happens here love it but but here's we start with the mixer so it's this giant mixer and i have to clean it out you see this you could like put somebody in there yes that can hit that can hold up to 100 pounds of flour and that is um that that 100 pounds of flour makes i don't think about 540 bagels so that you make five this is this very cool, as the New York Times said, Rube Goldberg machine. This is a bagel machine that a uh, woman who walked in here, her husband kind of invented this thing. And it, it's all just, you know, gears and chains and like, you'll see this, like wheels, nothing really high tech. Nothing high tech. Okay, I was gonna say. We put, whoops, we put the dough in here. Mm -hmm. It gets cut here, dropped here, and then it out pops a bagel. And you do feel like you're on the Lucille Ball show with that. When, yes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Have you made a video of that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and actually, when my mother was alive and she was like 83 when I opened my first bagel operation, um, she was like catching them singing the song from I Love It. I Love Lucy. She just loved it. So here's some crazy dough I'm working on. It's, it's experimental dough actually, because I experiment all the time. So these are different types of dough. I, it's kind of the same recipe with one little change. Okay. And um, after that dough calms down a little bit and warms up, I'm going to cut it and run it through that machine. Amazing. Um, and then 
what happens is, is once you, I'm now in like this chamber here, but once, once you make bagels and you poof them, they have to sleep overnight in the cooler. Here's a cooler. Oh. And so they're like kids. They're like all of us. They need to sleep in order to be rejuvenated. But that's, that's like a, a low temperature cooling area. Yeah. Okay. So it has to be at 38 degrees. So, and you can, I do multiple levels of cooling and warming and cooling and warming. So it kind of changes the texture of it. Got it. Um, this is this oven, which, you know, the standard New Yorker, I don't know. Um, you always have to boil a bagel, boil or steam it. Okay. And how you do it depends on how it comes out. This oven I call it a boil in place oven because it actually pours the water into the oven oh. and then drenches all the bagels at once. And then bakes them? And then bakes them. Ah. And um, I'll walk in there. You want to come in the oven with me? Sure. <laughs> How can you even go in? Well, it's not on. You're just, well, uh, it's not on. I'm just walking in the oven. So in here, <laughs> can you see it? Yeah, they pull out. Yeah, so this is right. So this is where the water comes in and it pours in here and it just makes like a sauna. But you don't want to be in here. Only the bagels can be in here. Right, unless you're wearing a bathing suit. Yeah. Um, and then, then here's the rack that it goes on. I was going to say the racks go in there and then the water happens in the bake. Right. Okay. And they all bake. So I can bake 270. So I can boil and bake 270 in like uh, 15 minutes. But and pe some people are like set on, I want to do the boil. So we do that with them, you know, and then there's a different kind of oven, but there's this whole other piece. I'm going to turn off that light again. There's this whole other piece of sustainability, right? I've been really thinking about this a lot because a typical bagel uh, kettle is 45 gallons of water. Okay. And maybe you can do a thousand bagels in that a day. I mean, cause you really should be cleaning it out. So if you do a thousand bagels in it, and some of that evaporates, you're still, your wastewater is about 350 pounds, plus all the sludge and everything. Sure. So the same amount of bagels and that thing, it's three pounds of wastewater. It's three it's, pounds? Three pounds. I mean, and you get like a great thing. So, you know, I just think about things in different ways. I don't always think about it like, oh, this is the most traditional way we have to do it. It's like, sure. how can we do it better? That's great. You know, and I was, I was going to ask what happens now in the pandemic with your business? Did you have a storefront or many? Um, no, I never had storefronts. I only had a factory. I'll show okay. you a picture of the factory. I had a factory in Maine. Um, it was powered by water actually. And then I left that and I came here. Um, we, ca we came to New Jersey to start producing out of this space. And then we got investors who actually put the product into the kosher market. It was called Spelt Right, but we're not doing it anymore. The grain price was so unstable. Like it went from 80 cents a pound to a to dollar to 130 to 275. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you just can't no. build a business on that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, and Frank, who saw, sold me all my equipment originally here, he just said to me, he knew I had taught for years. I was also a teaching assistant in law school. So he knew I had teaching ability. So I taught mm -hmm. swimming, taught law, and now I'm teaching this, right? It's, this is, I guess, a piece of advice. It's like, think about what you did as a kid that even yes. has value, right? Right. I mean, I, I what I learned as a kid in my mother's, you know, commissary kitchen, teaching uh, people to swim. And then my parents used to make me count the money backwards. And, you know, always, because it was all a cash business. So we were always counting. So all my formulas are basic algebra, but I'm calculating them in my head all the time. And I know it goes right back to that yes. lesson learned. Incredible. What a foundation. Yeah, I'm lucky. You know, I always tell people to think about what they did for summer jobs, adults yeah. that have lost jobs. And I remember working at a dry cleaners for three years, six days a week, eight to six. It was over 90 degrees. It was a lot of work. I learned customer service. I learned you know, resilience. I heard, learned how to keep going when you're exhausted, Right. how to deal with conflict, et cetera, et cetera. And then I wanted to do something different and I wanted to sell ice cream and drive an ice cream truck. My dad did the math and he was like, no, you won't make <laughs> enough money. So I decided to paint houses. I worked for college pro painters and it was a lot of work, six days a week. 
but I learned a lot. Yeah. This, well, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because so many of the people who are, and I am working with corporate executives, I'm working with pilots, I'm working with people, some people who are just uh, first time out in the workplace, uh, you know, a mother who's been raising her kids for 30 years, basically. Now it's time and she's pivoting out of that. Yes. But I taught so many of these people actually did some sort of food service work when they were younger and they're hearkening back to it. But we talk numbers all the time. So if you want, I mean, I do some real basic algebra for people. Okay. Like, how do I know I'm going to make money? Yeah. Okay. So these are things and not just for a bagel shop, but for any business. So you say, okay, just say I'm taking 30 days off a year for whatever reason. Okay. So 335 days. Okay. Mm-hmm. How much money do I may, need to make each day to make a certain amount. Well, we have figured out that $1,500 a day coming in the door is $503,000 or it's close to that. Okay? okay. You double that. Now you're making a million six. Mm. How do you do that? And I'll say, okay, you have a hundred people come in. You, you make sure that they buy $15 worth of stuff. <laughs> you know, right. like as you're, as they're looking at the bagel display and the schmear display and the coffee mm. and the salad that you have out here and everything that you've, created you have to become your own sales person yes. you know and it's and so for me it's really important when people are taking on these businesses if there is someone someone who really has that passion for it not the only person working but then teaches everybody else in that place that that passion has to come through you so bet been in a business if you're selling clothing if you're selling anything else you take that you know that really general number right yes and you build it and yes. you say, okay, now I have to reach that goal. It, it can't be. And so then it becomes very concrete what you need to do. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Because you're working backwards. Right. Right. Where do I need to be? Where do I need to be? Yeah. And yeah. how do I, and um, that's what I do in my own business now. Where do I need to be? And how many clients do I need? And how much is it realistically that I can do this? Like mm-hmm. what price do I need to charge to get to that? Yes. So, and for years I undervalued myself. I'm just going to say. Yeah, I, I tend to do the same. And <laughs> yeah. Why? Why do you think that happens? Um, hesitant to, to come up with a number that looks like I don't deserve it. Hmm. Or, you know, I'm too expensive. That? Do you do that as women, though? I mean, honestly. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Huh. And I, I once heard somebody say, you need to name your price and stand by it confidently. Yes. That's it. Yes. That's my advice. Right now, and then even now, people are saying, well, "You're not charging enough." Like it's interesting because I, you go kind of you test it, and then I have to look at where I'm comfortable. Like, how am I comfortable? And, and are there other ways I can make money too? You know, it's yes. not just with the consulting. But I love, I love working with people. Um, we weed out ninety percent of the people who contact us. You do? Yes. 90% because they're not committed to, to what you're doing. No, it's because I don't think they understand the expense involved. It's expensive to put in a bagel shop. It's like, you know, we say minimum 250 and we have a few people who've reached that minimum. Mm-hmm. It's usually more like $450,000, you know, it's expensive. So yeah. how do you like, do you have that money? Are you willing to risk it? Are you going to finance it? Do you have the ability to finance and then if people live in the part of the U.S., which there aren't many anymore, where you can actually buy a building, I recommend that. I'm like, buy a building. Good idea. Because you're going to put all this equity into this building. You're going to yes. build in all these improvements. And then your lease is up, and you can't take that with you. So you right. better have earned it in that five years or 10 years. You've had right. It. I would so. say if they have the money now, buy the building and employ people, especially students that need paid internships. They need the experience. Yes, I think, and I actually have some recent grads working with me, not recent, recent, but who are great. Um, and they're actually creating their own businesses. And I help them, I'm like, look, you create a single person LLC. <laughs> you, know, you charge X amount or whatever you want to charge. You create a website that costs you almost nothing. Mm-hmm. And now, and you put down in this website, all these things you've done you have now created a persona yes, and, and legitimacy for yourself. So even the people I, who I've hired as independent contractors, I, I'm constantly advising them. 
on, you know, make your, look, you're doing it. You get a lot of publicity with me now working with me, but take that and use it. Yes. You know, parlay that into, parlay that into something else. Yeah. That's fantastic. Isn't, don't you like empowering people? Isn't that a good I do. Thing? I do. Especially when it comes to learning how to be resilient right now when people are going through a hard time and there, you know, there's a lot to learn about yourself and that it's okay to be scared about pivoting or jumping into something else, but there's never been a better time. I agree. I mean, this time has opened up a lot of opportunity. I mean, I think I'm busier than ever mm-hmm. because of COVID. Right. Not like COVID kind of did the reverse for me yeah. because I have a skill that I can teach people to become self-sufficient. And that's what I'm trying to do. Which is and, so important. Yeah. So we work with people for 12 to 15 months, you know, and it's just like one price. I, I hate the lawyer mode where it's an hourly fee. Sure. I don't want to do that. And I, and maybe you heard at that meeting, this woman's like, well, how do you make money if you're not like getting them everywhere along the way? And right. I'm like, cause I set my price where I, feel it's reasonable for everybody yes and just my it's not my interest in in capitalizing on every moment with a person that's good because, because then I just become a drag to them I don't become right. the person who's empowering them to do something yes else. so I also find that I do stuff for free sometimes if I'm asked to do a talk different places maybe the university where I went to school mm-hmm. I don't mind doing it if I'm going to make an impact on somebody's life that's a win-win. I agree with that. I mean, I, and I just have, I'm just going to lighten this thing up a little bit, a uh, little better. Okay. Now I can see you better. Okay. Um, no, I agree. And you know, and I, I don't know, I, and I'm just, I'll talk to you about this unfranchised model. I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but more of like, if you look at what happened during COVID, there's some major franchise chains that fell. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's, because they're so connected to the success of the franchisee that they have put so much pressure on them. Right. You know, they had the, that franchisee has to buy the ingredients from them, buy the equipment from them, or whatever they're doing. They have to give them a piece every month, whether they're making or not, you right. know? And so there's no room in, a, in the franchise model, in my view, for bumps in the road. You know, I'm sure other people don't want to hear this, but this is kind of a bump in the road model for me. And I think I came out of that because I saw my parents for 53 years run this business. And there were times when they were really low and there were times when they were high, but they could withstand the low. They own their own property. That was a big deal. They weren't dependent on paying rent to somebody. So Mm -hmm. then that just maybe meant that we didn't, you know, we didn't have the best milk available to us in the house. You know, we might get powdered milk instead of regular milk. I mean, there was just adjustments that happened. You had milk. Well, we had milk. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I I mean, it also makes you realize what you can be thankful for, you know, having gratitude for the things you have because there are a lot of other people struggling. Yeah. You know, I, there was something, I just got your book yesterday. (laughs) I got pressure to read it all. I I, like, oh my God, this girl's going to need some uh, attention soon. Okay. I'll let you go soon. um, I should I don't know if you have another meeting, but we'll get off and I'll show you how the machine runs. Like, I would love that. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so the, you know, the, you were talking about failure being good, right? Failure is okay. Failure's like, okay. and it's actually how you define failure. Right. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I'm now not looking at any mistake I've made as a mistake, but as an opportunity, like I really screwed up yesterday, forgot to put yeast in one of the batches. And then I took it out, played with the yeast, ran it through the machine again. And I'm, you know, crossing my fingers today. I mean, I don't have to sell this stuff. I'm just testing it. But okay. But I look at that mistake as a good one, because if my client makes that mistake, I'll say, you know, this is the way you can fix it. That's great. Right. And then right. the other thing, my dad, I remember I was super hyper in high school, just trying to get ready for college, do whatever I need to do. And then he's like, mm-hmm. he goes, stop. I hope you fail. And I was like, what? He's yeah. Like, I hope you fail. Because, because it's going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. Oh. And, and I mean, it gives me the chills because he didn't yes. say he worked two jobs, you know, he worked yeah. at home and then he worked at fa- a factory in the midnight job, you know, the, the midnight shift, the uh, graveyard shift. 
because he needed the insurance. Yeah. And so, and a little extra money. And he, uh, and I really, you know, I, I process that and that's been with me because I don't fear failure. That's I, good. It just, because if you fear fail, failure, you're putting a wall up to yourself, right? right? It's, what's the worst thing that can happen? Somebody can say, no, you don't make yeah. the money, but you'll get back up and do something. Exactly. And you'll come back up with a better idea with, you know, I had somebody tell me last week um, who was on my show, Sandy, Sandy Greenberg, um, he is blind. And he wrote a book about his experience being friends with Art Garfunkel and, and he wanted to drop out of college and Art wouldn't let him hmm. and his girlfriend wouldn't let him who later became his wife. But the reason I'm telling you this is because he told me, Janine, I need you to take the next few days off and breathe hmm. <laughs> and not think about things so hard mm -hmm. and just step away. And yeah. I woke up Monday morning with some of the best ideas because I felt recharged. Yeah, we need to also, and I think you and I are similar in that way. I mean, we push ourselves. I could see, I mean, the way oh, yeah. we push ourselves. And you also talked about not being almost like your shoulder being frozen. I mean, I'm oh. getting, yeah, I have, um, I, I haven't been public about this, but I have something called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. I just diagnosed, I've had it my whole life, but it's this hyperelasticity to my body. So all things hurt, like the collagen doesn't work. So you have to like stretch and do things? Like no, I'm not supposed to stretch because what happens is, is when I stretch, it doesn't go back. And so I just, and it can implicate all different organs and everything. So all of a sudden I'm like, now I find myself at all these different doctor's appointments, which I'm not used to. But what's great is through this, I have found these amazing practitioners who aren't doctors. There are people who work with people like me, like mm -hmm. it's anywhere from one in five to one in 40,000 people have this. It's, it's not rare, rare, but it's like, so like I can bend my hand backwards. I can do reverse namaste. I always thought that was just cool. I didn't think it was a thing <laughs> <laughs> until I get in my fifties. I'm like, ah, you know, and part of it is that, but it's now I have to embrace that. I can't, yes. I can't say I have this. No wonder why my knee would go out of location. Right. This or, oh no, here we go. It's all downhill from here. Right. No, as a matter of fact, I just learned that there's certain exercises that I can do. And I'm going to go to this woman in Manhattan to, to fix injuries from birthing the kids 30 years ago, you know? And it's like, this is incredible. Incredible. So without this like little diagnosis, I wouldn't have known that there were ways to fix all the little things yes yes that are you have a great mindset i mean you were like and this happened but you know what's great about this i mean who, who does that <laughs> well what am i supposed to do like am i supposed to like cry about like i can't Some people would and I, I i have decided and what happens is the more like little things happen along the way which sometimes they're big things is yeah you, the more i want to find a direction to something else like sure. and yeah. i find when people get into themselves too much that's when we start getting depressed so during yeah. the covid lockdowns i started volunteering if i could you know even at some of the food kitchens and then helping others it's a little bad that i'm not doing that now but i'm still busy but now i'm donating money you know okay so i can at least do it being thoughtful to others is so important right now yeah yeah always always yeah. i think yeah you know and if we can I think an advantage I had growing up, honestly, is to have been brought up in this little snobby college town, right? Having parents who were not college educated. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't have strong accents or at all, but their first language was Arabic. So the way they spoke, the syntax wasn't the same as everyone else around me. And there was, and my dad worked in a factory. And so I got to like be like interact with the whole span. And great, yeah, you know, and I'm comfortable in all those places, but I'm most empathetic to the span of people who are really struggling and working hard to better themselves. It's great, they can. So, so we have to wrap up, but can I have your website so we can share with yeah. everyone? BYOBBagels.com. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. wear this because I'm interviewing clients all the time, you know. And, so uh, B Y O B with another B A G E L S dot com. Okay. Be your but also, you know, I'm here to just—I I don't want to just hang and talk to people, but really to encourage them 
So I have um, active clients right now, about 20, which is a lot. I mean, I used to do about uh, five a year, maybe. And that's just in this two month period. So like 20. I have assistant. Um, we're constantly, there's constantly more people checking in. But as I said, we don't, we really vet people. It's important. But when I talk to them, I'm really nice about it. I don't ever want anybody to feel less than because they're not ready for it. Sure. Or, or maybe even give them more suggestions. Right. And so that's good. I'm actually working on a lower profile shop to see if there are opportunities for people who don't have the money for the big investment. So I'm, I'm investigating that. That's a good idea, especially right now during the mm -hmm. pandemic, if people want to have this little storefront or whatever. Can it, be done? can it be done on a smaller profile? It hasn't been, but I think it can be. And yeah, so I'm researching. Good idea. Excellent. Well, keep checking in with me about what you're doing and uh, give me updates. Yeah. And if you want off, off camera, if you want to see the bagel, I'm going to do one. I would, one. I would love to. I wish I could eat one. All right. Well, okay. thank you so much. And yeah. I've loved this and I'll keep you posted. Okay, great.